Cool. We still have got some more people joining in, but we're going to go ahead and get started uh, so that we can get through all this amazing content. Um, so welcome, everybody. We are officially at episode number four of Let's Develop. I'm your host, Chris Woolley. And uh, I think by now you probably know what's going on here. This is a free one hour webinar where we're bringing in experts from the photography industry and they're sharing information and having kind of a casual, candid conversation with you about how you can improve your photography, how you can improve your business, and just have more fun in the industry. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, we've got a new episode that comes out every two weeks. Um, so we've been doing this for a couple of months now, and uh, there's always exciting content that's coming forward. Uh, but I do have to be, do a big shout out to American Color Imaging. Um, ACI is who's making this possible. Um, so if you've never heard of them, American Color Imaging is a professional photo lab. They're very supportive of the industry and sharing information, kind of giving stuff back on it. Uh, so make sure to give them a big thank you and kind of a shout out to what's happening here. Um, so for those that are brand new to this, uh, we're going to be having our guest Lisa ask today where we're learning how to talk dogs, so learning about pet photography. Um, but we are in a webinar format, which means we're live. So if you look on the right side of the screen by where the chat is, there's a little chat icon that has a question mark in it. You can type in your questions there. And throughout the program, Lisa and I will be looking and monitoring that chat and we'll be answering your questions live. So if you have one, make sure you pop over to that question section. So we know that it's actual question versus a comment and it doesn't get missed. You can also vote up the uh, question. Uh, meaning that uh, more people have that same question. So we know that it's high priority and we can expand on that or make sure that we address that if we do start to run low on time. Um, also wanna make sure that we're staying until the end of the program. It is a one hour program here, um, but stay to the end. We've got some prizes from ACI. Uh, I've also got a special offer on one of Lisa's favorite products. Um, so you can kind of uh, check out some of that stuff that's gonna be giveaways right at the end of the program. Um, if you've also missed previous episodes of this, they are on ACI's website. You can go to acilab.com slash let's dash develop, um, including the program that we had Woody Walters uh, a couple of weeks ago where we were learning creative brushwork in Photoshop. Uh, we've got baby photography. We've got marketing for photographers. All those episodes are archived and on ACI's website. Um, so make sure to check those ones out. Okay, so now we're on to the exciting part. We've got our guest today, Lisa, um, and she is going to be guiding us through pet photography. Um, so we're gonna be learning from the master pet photographer and uh, learning some of her tips, tricks, and secrets on how to run a successful pet photography business. So for those of you that don't know Lisa, which I'm pretty sure almost everybody does because she's quite active in our industry. She's a master photographer, a master artist, a photographic craftsman, certified professional photographer, past president of the Twin Cities PPA, director of, director of Animal Image Makers, a PPA counselor. She's run like a crazy amount of awards like the Kodak, Fuji, LexJet, District Awards, GIA finalists, she's been a photographer of the year multiple times, Elite Plus member, uh, she also has a Tangerine House of Design in Minnesota, and she's been photographing pets since 2001, and it's now her niche market. So she is crazy experienced here, and she's got a lot of great information to share with us. So Lisa, it's officially your time. I know you've got a ton of content to uh, share with us here, so the floor is officially yours. All right, thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming. I'm really excited to share a little bit about pet photography with you guys tonight. Um, you know, of course, with in one hour, we can't get into every single detail about what it takes to photograph pets, but my hope is that this overview will give you some tips and some tricks and some help for, for you guys going into a pet session. Um, and, and I'm gonna just kind of tell you what I do and, and my philosophies of pet photography as well. So I'm gonna share my screen because I've got a ton of info for you. Let me click the right button here. Um, entire screen. Right, it's always okay, like a puzzle so, on these virtual things, huh? <laughs> I know. So you'll have to tell me if you're seeing this or not, because now yep, I can't can see, see you guys anymore. Okay, perfect. We are full <laughs> I love screen. it. How to talk dog. Yay. 
I love it. Okay, perfect. Then we are good to go. So um, I also want to thank ACI for um, for helping out with this. I think this is such an awesome series, and there are going to be so many different topics, um, both that you guys have already heard, hopefully, or you can access now, and the ones that are coming up. And I love ACI. They're my lab of choice, and they do amazing things. And I love that they support the community and the industry so much. So a huge shout out to them. So let's get into this. Um, now, let me see. It. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right, we've got five different areas of pet photography that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so our topics are going to be how to prepare for a dog session, safety with working with dogs. The bulk of tonight is going to be the session itself and, and how we go about that and, and what we do throughout the session. Um, I'm going to also talk about having a dog wrangler a little bit and the importance of that. And then um, hopefully if time allows, I want to talk a little bit about inspiration as well. But I want to first show you guys um, just a little bit of my work so you understand what I do and kind of where I come from. So enjoy this little slideshow. Good music. <laughs> All right. I love it. It's so much fun. You can't work without smiling the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> like well, you know, that's the best part about being a pet photographer is you get to play with dogs all day long. And I love it. And how can you not smile? It's it's so great. So, and I know that that was super fast and I set it to the music really fast, but I just wanted to give everybody kind of a quick look at a bunch of my work. So you can just see overall. So let's get into all the doggy details. And again, if you guys have questions, put them in the Q&A. And after each little section, um, we'll answer questions if you've got them. Um, the first two sections are gonna be pretty quick. And then the, like I said, the bulk of it is going to be what we do actually in a session. So so um, the first thing really is preparation and how to get ready for a pet session. I like to have several different types of toys and noisemakers available. Um, dogs do get bored really, really quick and they need a variety. So different toys, different noisemakers, um, all sorts of things just to keep their attention. Um, I, I like to think of dogs a lot like toddlers where they just have such short attention spans. So so keep it interesting and keep it um, keep a variety for them. Also tips for uh, food. <laughs> I like to have treats on hand, but I don't use them unless I absolutely have to. A lot of times um, they can be a great motivator, but they can also be a huge distraction. Um, some dogs, once the treats come out, it's all about the treats and they're drooling all over. They won't sit still because they just come to you for a treat. And it's, a lot of times it will actually distract a dog. So have them ready to go if you need them, but don't pull them out unless you absolutely have to. I also like to have several prop options available, um, which will add interest and contain the pet. And what I mean by containing the pet is that dogs will learn really quickly that that's the spot you want them to be in. And when they get a reward when they're in that spot, they tend to gravitate toward it and go right back. So if you've got an ottoman or a chair or um, the, the, the little guy um, with the blue background is sitting on like a one of those poof balls, and this was just a little puppy, so he fit up there just fine. Um, these guys learn really quick if we have treats out or toys out or something like that. They don't get that reward unless they're in that spot. And they learn so fast, they they gravitate right back there. And that makes your life a lot easier keeping them there. A lot of times when I'm not using a prop like that and I've got dogs off leash, um, they don't understand which spot on the floor they need to be on. And so they're kind of all over the place, which is fine too, because then we do get some of those candid shots. But if you really want them to focus, that's a, a huge way to do it. That's worked really well for me. I also like to have a dog wrangler, if I can, somebody who gets it. And that makes it so much easier because they know the poses that you like to do. They know how to get the dog's expression, how to get them to stay in place, where exactly they need to be. I've had owners and like, if you don't have a dog wrangler per se, you can, you can train the owners to be that really quickly. And I've had to do that over the years. Um, but I've also had owners who don't 
get where they need to be. They, they don't understand that they need to be off to the side. They think that if they're behind the dog, like we're not going to see them on camera. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way at all. <laughs> so having somebody who really understands that concept and has learned from you and works well with you um, is, is such a great way to approach it. And it really gives the client the chance to sit back and kind of watch the show, so to speak, and really enjoy it. Um, a lot of them like to be involved in, in, in like to work. So th like I almost never have anybody who is afraid to jump in and help, but it's really fun for them if they can sit back and see how their dog performs. I also like to have a water bowl ready to go. Um, dogs do pant and they do get hot and they will need a little drink, but don't put the water bowl down for them until it's time for them to get a drink. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. One is that, of course, the more water they drink, the quicker they're going to have to use the bathroom. And puppies especially have very small bladders, so they're going to have to go really quickly. But also, um, especially long-haired dogs, they will their hair around their mouth will get wet, and that's not going to be as attractive in the image. Um, Dogs that have come in just from the groomer or who look really, really good, like the owners do not want their face wet because they've just spent a lot of time and money getting their dogs groomed specifically for their portrait. So be really careful with that. Keep it off, off of the um, floor so the dog can't get at it. And just, I usually tell the owner, there's a bowl of water ready to go right there. If you think your dog needs a drink, go ahead and give it to them. Um, but I'm also the person who like, once they're done drinking, I will pick it up and get it off the floor again right away. So A, they don't drink more, but B, I don't trip on it. And I have I've done that and I've had water all over the floor. So be careful for that as well. I also like to keep my studio cool so the dog doesn't overheat and you end up with very long tongues. That is not an attractive image, <laughs> the really long tongue. Uh, so in the summer, I keep my air conditioner cranked way up and I am freezing in there, but the dogs are really comfortable. And in the winter, I keep my, uh, my heat very low. So again, it's really cool in there and I'm freezing, but the dogs are very comfortable. Like the opposite okay, of babies. Okay, so what was that, Chris? It's like the opposite of babies. <laughs> yeah, yes, come one hundred percent the opposite of babies. I like the air conditioner exactly. way better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I like to being able to bundle up and then just like take my sweatshirt off or whatever, and I'm good, good to go. Uh, were there any questions about dog preparation? I know that was super fast. Probably so not. Far, no <laughs> questions coming through. I'm monitoring chat, so if we see something, I'll make sure we're flagging them. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's get into safety. And again, this is going to be kind of a quick section because the most of what we're going to talk about is is the session itself. Um, really, you know, with with dogs and with anything, safety is key. You want to make sure that you're safe and the dogs are safe and your clients are safe. So, a couple of things to think about um, relating to safety is what to do when the dog arrives. Um, I I always let the dogs explore the studio. I want them to be comfortable. If they're not comfortable in their environment, they're going to be nervous and they're not going to be as um, outgoing as they typically would be um, if they had just, a, you know, a few minutes, five minutes, maybe just to kind of run around and sniff things and explore and understand where they're at. Um, I like to keep my studio feeling like somebody's house. And I had a home studio for a long time. I'm back in a commercial studio now, but it still really feels homey because I don't want the dogs thinking that they're going to the vet's office because a lot of them do get very nervous like that. And so I want them just to think that it's going to be a fun and it's going to be a play date. And that way they're going to relax a little bit more and be really comfortable in their environment. I also just ignore the dog when it arrives. I just have a friendly conversation with the owner. I greet them. I welcome them. I have a short little stool that's probably a foot off the floor that I'll sit down on while the dog is running around and just ignore the dog completely. Like I said, talk to the owner. And when the dog is ready, it's going to come over to me and say hi. And that's also going to help it, uh, its comfort level. If I push myself on the dog, um, it might not be ready for that yet. And it wants to understand its environment before getting to know me as a person. So um, like I said, I let the dog off leash to explore and sniff around. And then as I'm sitting down there, the dog will approach me and say hi. And typically what happens in that situation is it'll come over, it'll sniff me really quick and then it'll keep going. And then once it's done with that, it'll come back over to me and then it'll be like, oh, hey, I'm ready to be scratched. And you know, like here I am. And, and it'll be all lovey-dovey and, and really fun. So that's what I do when the dog arrives. Um, but before working with a dog, there are things that you guys need to keep in mind. Um, much like people, dogs don't like somebody standing over them and reaching down. That's very intimidating. And especially when they meet somebody initially, um, standing over, an, over, over a dog can be a sign of um, dominance, which 
that can work to your benefit, but not initially. Initially, you want to be a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with the dog and not be in that dominant role. But once you start working with the dog and kind of training the dog for the session, like working with it to sit or to go down or that kind of thing, then you know, standing over the dog a little bit and getting it into those poses will work out to your benefit. Um, a lot of owners don't understand that and they get down on the floor, they sit or they're on their knees or something like that. And they're basically eye to eye with the dog and the dog is then not paying attention to them and not listening to them. And a lot of times I tell the owners stand up and then give those directions and instantly it works, um, the, the standing over. But when you first start working with that dog, you don't want to necessarily be doing that and especially really close um, to the dog. You don't want to intimidate it. Now, I know this isn't true for all people, but dogs typically don't like being touched on the rear end when they first meet somebody. Now, dogs do love a butt scratch, but again, they need to be comfortable with you before you can reach out and scratch their butt. Um, if you come up behind a dog, you're going to surprise them every single time they're going to jump and they're not going to know what's going on. Um, if it's on their terms and they're coming to you for love and for scratches, that's great. But um, yeah, if that dog is running around your studio and sniffing around and, and just checking everything out, don't sneak up behind it just to scratch its butt or touch its butt because that's going to not go well. Also sustained eye contact. And this is also true for, uh, for people. Like nobody likes to be stared down by somebody else. And so if you're constantly looking right at the dog and looking into its eyes and you're not looking away, um, that's also very intimidating for the dog and it's going to make them very uncomfortable. Um, when a dog is uncomfortable, you know, bad things can happen. If they feel like they need to protect themselves, that's when people get bit or another dog might get bit. So you just really have to think about those things and, and, uh, and be careful with how you approach working with dogs. Also, sudden movements. If all of a sudden you you know you jump and you do something uh, that's a little bit crazy, that they're not going to be expecting that either, and that's going to scare them a little bit. And then also loud noises. Um, last year, you know, last year was a, a really different year in so many ways. But because of COVID, last year so many of our communities canceled their fireworks celebrations. And I don't know if that's true around around where you guys are, but it, it is very true here in Minneapolis. And so um, what happened was people just went out and got their own fireworks and there were fireworks going off everywhere like all up and down the streets like people were just doing their own thing in their own yards and it was really crazy and that was super hard for a lot of dogs to hear all those loud noises and so what happened right after that um right after the fourth of july is when i reopened my studio we were closed down for three months because of covid and so it was in july that i reopened and the dogs who came for sessions shortly after the fourth of july um as i was photographing them and the lights would go off they make a little popping sound and so many more dogs than ever before it, like hated those like they would just cower when uh when the lights would go off they would run away they didn't know what was going on because they were so overstimulated by the fireworks and those loud noises are really scary for dogs so you got to be careful with that as well Okay, um, safety is key. I said this earlier too. I always ask my owner in advance about the dog's personality. If they're food driven or toy driven, if they're aggressive toward men or women or to other dogs, if there are any issues that I need to know about in advance. And if I know that, that's something that I can work with, but it's the unknown that's really scary. Um, years ago, I, I'll never forget this. I had um, a Borzoi come into the studio. And if you don't know what that is, it's, it's basically like a greyhound, but larger and hairier. <laughs> so it's in the sighthound family. And, the, you know, the dog was just kind of loopy and kind of out of it. And I just like it was the first time I'd ever worked with a Borzoi. So I'm, I thought, well, I don't know, maybe it's its personality. The owners didn't say anything about it. And they weren't acting like anything was different. So, OK, so I'm down there and I'm in its face, you know, trying to get friendly and trying to get it to relax and, um, you know, doing my thing. And again, like don't get into a dog's face unless it comes to you and, and wants some love. Um, because what I found out afterwards was that this dog is very aggressive. It could not go out into public without being drugged. And that's why it was so loopy because they had the dog drugged while, for, while it was in for its session. So it was just standing there kind of spacing out. And had I known that the dog was aggressive, there's no way I would have gone down there and petting it and in its face and like all of that kind of stuff that scared me so much. So I always tell my owners that come in during their consultation that story so that they understand if I know that your dog has an issue, I can work with it. Um, if I know that your dog is aggressive toward men, I'm not gonna have um, a dog wrangler who's a man. I'll get somebody who's a woman if we need somebody to come in. If your dog isn't good with other dogs um, and it, you know, you've got multiple dogs, we're not gonna put them together in a photo 
because if it's, you know, it's usually a little higher energy and there's overstimulation and there's a lot of stuff that happens during a session. And so if your dog doesn't typically get along with other dogs, like that might just be enough for them to act out toward the other dog, even though they live together. I've had sessions where um, the dogs who live together cannot be in the same room because things will happen, but yet the, the owners want the dogs to be in the same photo. And I have to tell them it's never gonna happen, but what we can do is we can really plan it and then we can put them together, we can composite them together later in Photoshop to make it work. And that always works. Or you can even just do individual photos and frame them together afterwards. And it's still them together, same background, same lighting, same feel, just separate photos. And that totally works as well. So really you need to talk to your owners to find out what's going on with their dog. Are there any issues that you need to know about um, and, and just really be safe with them. I, uh, like I said, I'm always conscious of those concerns when I'm working with them because I don't want anybody to end up injured. I don't want any bites. I don't want the dogs to be bit. I don't want the owners to be bit, like none of that kind of stuff. So be very conscious of those concerns when you work with them. Don't get in the dog's face. Um, again, especially when you first meet a dog, that's going to be very intimidating for them. So let them come to you. And if they're going to be aggressive, if you know that there's a problem with the dog, then, you know, don't let the dog come to you. You might want to keep that dog on a leash. And, you know, it's okay to take a break. This can be photographing dogs sometimes. And it, it, like owners are like, oh my God, I've got the worst dog ever. And there's sometimes there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of chaos that goes into it. And if you start to feel overwhelmed, take a break. And that's totally okay. If you feel like the dog is overwhelmed or the owner is overwhelmed, it's okay to take a break for that as well. Sometimes you just need a minute or two just just to breathe and just relax. And maybe all of a sudden, if, you know, if you don't want to just say, let's just take a break, you need to like switch the card in your camera or just some quick little technical thing that you can do just so that you can breathe for a minute or two. And honestly, like clients never care. They're totally fine if, if anybody needs a break. And a lot of times what happens is the dog will, will also just feel that, that whoo, and just end up going and laying down and relaxing and all that chaos is just gone. So it's totally okay to do that. There you go, or if the dog needs it. <laughs> and then also really watch sign for signs of stress. And some of those are all listed here for you guys. Panting, walking away, yawning, shedding, licking their lips, tucking their tail, cowering, like the dog in the photo here is just cowering, um, refusing to get a drink, no eye contact by the dog. Now these are all things that are totally normal for dogs and may not mean that they're stressed out. But if you start seeing multiple things happening all at the same time, you're probably gonna have a dog that's stressed out. So just keep those in the back of your mind. And if things keep happening over and over, um, you need to take a break. And not all dogs are comfortable in a studio and especially with flash too. If you see that a dog, like the flash goes off and the dog runs away, of course, positive rewards are always great, and you might need to, you know, get that dog acclimated to the flash. But if you have a backup lighting source other than Studio Flash, if you're working in a studio, um, I've got window lights, so I can just open my curtains and have nice, beautiful directional window light. Constant lights are great for a backup source as well. So you need to think about those things in advance too. So if you do have a dog who is um, afraid of the flash or stressed out by that, you have an alternate source. I've also just brought dogs outside, and that's that's worked well as well. Typically, I work in studio, but it's it's always a great option. So Carly had a question on that. Do you find that there's a lot of dogs that don't like flash? No, most dogs are totally fine with it. Every once in a while, I have one that doesn't. And what, what I like to do is invite the dogs to come in during the consultation. We'll do the consultation in advance. And if the dogs come along, we can actually test the flash before their session. We can see how they react to them. And it's not like all stress is on for the session. It has to go beautifully because this is it. Um, if we know in advance, all right, that dog hates it, I can set up for window light and I can, you know, we can make a game plan for that. But it, also if we know in advance that the dog is totally fine with the flash, then we're, we're good to go. And there's no worrying about that in, when they come in. So I would highly recommend it. Not everybody can do that. If they come in on their lunch hour or something like that, they're not going to be able to bring their dog along. But if you can schedule it with their dog, that's going to give you a huge step forward. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Nope, that's the only question so far. But if you do have questions, okay. put them in the chat. We'll get them. Yeah, so this next section will probably have a lot more questions because this is going to be all about the session itself. And I've got a ton of information here. Oh, this is the um, it, Yeah, this will be the good one. And there are lots of like subcategories within this. So here we go. All right, so during the session, 
make I like to make sure that the dogs have been out for a business trip. And what I mean by that is that before they come into my studio, they go do their business. Um, that way they can empty their bladders, they can get everything out so that there is less of that of a chance of things happening when they come in. Now I always tell pet uh, photographers that it's a lot like newborn photography where, you know, everybody likes the little naked newborns, but what do newborns do when they come into the studio? They poop and they pee. It just happens. It happens all the time. And if they don't, it's just a huge bonus. And <laughs> if you go into a pet session with that mindset and they don't poop or pee, total bonus. Most of the time they're not going to poop or pee. <laughs> But there are dogs and especially male dogs who do mark. And so if you've had a dog who comes in and, and pees on the floor, you need to make sure that you've got some sort of a spray that will that will mask the smell, get rid of the smell, clean it up as, as quickly as you can and as thoroughly as you can. Because if the next dog who comes in smells that, they might end up peeing in exactly the same place to mark. So um, so look into that. There are sprays. Talk to a vet or talk to a pet store and, and you can get that stuff all the time. Uh, there are several different types available. Um, during your session, you also want to use uh, utilize patience and calmness. And again, um, there's a lot of chaos in pets in pet sessions. You know, pets are running around. Owners think their dogs are awful because they're not sitting still like they see in the photos. They think that all dogs are just going to come in and they're going to sit beautifully. And that's not at all how it goes. Um, and so we just try to stay calm. And if we're calm, then the owners are calm. And if the owners are calm, then the dog is going to be calm. Uh, dogs always react to however their owners are. If their owners are feeling stressed or if their owners are feeling um, like feeding chaos, then there's going to be a lot more of that. So I work really hard to make sure that the owners who are calm and they're patient and they understand that the dog is doing what dogs do and they don't have the worst dog in the world. Um, and a lot of times I'll even show them a photo or two on the back of the camera just so that they can see what I see and that we're getting great shots. I often tell them that it's, you know, it's a, a joke with my owners that it's a good thing we don't do video. We're doing still photography because with the video, you would see all the chaos that goes into these sessions because a lot of times it is not always, but a lot of times. And with still photography, you don't see that. And it's kind of the same thing with kids. You know, if you've got kids running around your studio, a lot of times there's chaos with that. But with still photography, you just capture that split second and the dog is going to look perfect, even though it might not be perfect, but that's okay. As long as it looks good. That's what's important. Yeah, exactly. As long as it looks good. Um, I like dogs to come into the studio just a little bit tired and a little bit hungry. And that means if they're a little bit tired, they're not going to be as active. It's going to be a calmer environment if they're tired. And if they're a little bit hungry, they're going to work for food. <laughs> so if we do, do need to use food for treats, they're going to be a little bit more attentive to that. And they're going to work a little bit harder to get that little snack. All right, so let's talk about lighting. Um, lighting is so important to any kind of photography that we do. Uh, with pets specifically, you need to really focus on their eyes. Um, well, obviously you're gonna focus on their eyes, but look at how the light is hitting their eyes. Um, dogs' eyes are different depending upon the breed and depending upon the dog. Um, Long-haired dogs might have hair that comes down in front of their eyes as well, so you might need to adjust their hair or you know, do something so that you get those catch lights in the eyes. Um, ultimately, you want both eyes to be lit. You want catch lights in those eyes. And so you might need to adjust your lights differently than what you would do for a person because each breed is going to be different. So black and white, and this is always a tricky thing with uh, with any kind of photography is how to how to balance that. But with dogs, what happens with black fur is that they absorb all the light and white fur reflects all the light. So what I like to do is um, with Pet, like this photo, for example, with pets of different colors, I will try to put the dark dog closest to my main light and the light dog furthest away from the main light, because that way, obviously, the majority of the light is going to hit the dark dog first. I will also try to turn that dog so I broad light the dog, and that way the majority of its body is being lit. And the lighter colored dog, I will short light that dog so the majority of its body is in shadow. And that's a really great way to kind of find a balance between the light and the dark and uh, and not lose detail in either. And of course, sometimes you just have to go into Photoshop and make those adjustments. So shooting raw is going to get you another little step further as far as editing goes to be able to salvage some of those if, if, if you can't get it right in camera and, and just by balancing your lights. So this is what I just said, a broad lighting a black dog and short lighting a light dog. So hopefully that makes sense. And if you don't know what broad lighting and short lighting means, you need to Google that. You need to go on YouTube. You need to figure that out because that is huge for any kind of photography. That's something that you should know. 
Okay, I believe that our job as photographers, regardless of whatever type of photography you do, whether it's people, whether it's real estate, whether it's landscapes, whether it's pets, our job as photographers is to take a three-dimensional object, and when we photograph it, it becomes a two-dimensional object but we want it to still look like a three-dimensional object in our photos. So you have to have highlight and shadow in order to achieve that. So in your chat right now, I want you guys to answer the question and Chris can let me know, what is this object? Go ahead and type in chat, everyone. What are you seeing up on the screen? Got circle coming in, orb, circle, sphere, green circle, green circle. 100%, it is just a circle. circle. Now. Yep. Question number two, what is this object? Ball. It's a ball, it's three-dimensional. Yes, it looks like green a sphere. sphere. It has ball. highlight it's and shadow. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same green ball, but when we add highlight and shadow, it makes it three-dimensional. Your computer screen is still flat. It isn't actually three-dimensional, but it has the appearance. And that same concept is true in our photography. Again, regardless of whatever it is that you're photographing, you need to have highlight and shadow in order to create depth in your image. So if you, again, use broad lighting and short lighting, as well as other styles of lighting to achieve that, um, if you understand those concepts, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to create that depth. I love drama. I love depth with my lighting. Um, I always say shadows are our friends. Shadows are a good thing because that's what gives us depth and dimension in our image. If you imagine the same dog in the same pose but really flatly lit, it would be so boring. We would not see all that muscle tone in the dog's shoulders. We would not see the texture of the fur. We would not see like the shape of the face the same way. Um, it, it would just not be the same image whatsoever. So use light to your advantage, create highlight, create shadow, and that's gonna give you depth. And it's gonna make your photography look so much better and so much different than people who are maybe just starting out or people who don't understand lighting, people who are, natural light photographers and just go out to the park in the middle of the day and um, have really harsh highlight and shadow. Like you have to learn how to control those things, um, but learn how to control those things because your photography will soar when you do. Okay, posing is gonna be another big one. I like to think about posing an animal much like I would a human, and many of the same rules are going to apply for this. Um, you don't want the, the animal straight onto the camera because also if you have an, an animal angle, that's also gonna help you create depth. I like to use a variety of different poses and a variety of different focal lengths when I photograph pets. So here are some examples of my favorite poses. Um, and I try to do as many of these as I can with every single session. So I'm gonna go kind of quick through these. So I like to do standing poses sitting poses, <laughs> lying down, playing and doing tricks with props that they bring in. I love the high angles, the low angles, and especially with small dogs. Um, owners of small dogs a lot of times never see them from a low angle. They're always looking down on their dog. So if you can lay down on the floor and almost shoot upward at a small dog, it's gonna give a very different perspective for those owners. The over the shoulder shot is always really fun. Not all dogs will do this, but um, when they do, I think it's super cute. The front paws up. This is probably the number one pose that I do in my studio. And again, I think it's a little bit different pose. And um, what happens in this pose is that the dogs end up flexing all of their muscles to kind of hold that pose. And uh, they just look so dynamic when they do that. Um, my owners love this pose. Full length poses. Close-ups with their siblings. So if somebody has multiple dogs, you wanna do them both together and separate so that you have variety when it comes to doing your sales sessions later. And of course, with their humans. Um, a lot of my clients don't wanna be in the photos at all. They just want it to be all about the dogs. Um, I tell them that they really should be in a couple of them. They don't have to order those if they don't like them, but that will give them options. And almost every single time they're gonna order those photos because they love them and they wanna be, like the, their dogs are their family. So they wanna be a part of it. So I always try to convince them just to be in a couple. And it's really funny. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day about uh, pet photography and how a lot of photographers who are not pet photographers don't have a lot of experience, but the experience that they have is when a family comes in for family portraits and they include the dog in just a couple shots because they're part of the family. And for me, it's totally the opposite. It's all about the dog. 
and then the, the family might be in a couple shots. <laughs> and I, I just you've find got that better really priorities fun. there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so fun. Okay, so a few tips and tricks for you guys as you are photographing the dogs. Um, you want to, like I said, try to keep the dog at an angle if possible, um, and especially when they sit down. If they are straight onto the camera, it's what I call the up the skirt shot, where all of a sudden they sit down and you can see everything that's going on between their legs. So if you turn the dog at like a 45 degree angle, you can use that front leg to kind of disguise all of that, or turn them totally profile to the camera so you don't see anything. Now, this dog in particular has beautiful coloring on its chest like it just like the the markings are so gorgeous that you see that when they're at a 45 degree angle and you lose some of that when they're turned totally profile and so you know you might want to take some of that into consideration as well but again variety is great so um whatever you can do to give your owners a variety and that's awesome here's another dog kind of similar um same dog same session we've got the up the skirt shot on the left and then we turn the dog a little bit 45 degrees and we disguise everything down there with that front leg but this one has a lot better markings a lot more interesting markings in my opinion on the side of the body as opposed to straight on it's just all white chest and so um it, it just looks very different and so keep that in mind as well but um try not to go straight on if at all possible. Usually if a dog is doing that, I'll try to zoom in and just crop like head and shoulder type shot because that's kind of cute straight on, but full body straight on is just, it's very flat and it's just not awesome. So there you go. Um, if you end up using a leash and it's okay if you do this, and especially when you're starting out, you might want to use a leash because you'll feel a little bit more in control of that. You want to turn the collar totally backwards so that the leash is behind the neck of the dog and then hold it straight up because that will make the retouching super easy. I've got another sample of that for you. And this is with four dogs. So here I had um, one person on each side and each person was holding onto two different leashes, but we've got all the collars turned totally backwards so that the, the clasps are in the back. And that way you don't have leashes in front of chests and hanging down and a lot of stuff to have to retouch out in front of the dog, which makes it a lot harder. And it's just that one straight line um, going out of the frame and there they are. And this one in particular, I also did a head swap on that second dog because they were all looking slightly off to the left except for that one guy. So boom, we uh, switched that out and now they all have the same eye direction as well, which is nice. Harnesses are awful. Don't use a harness unless you absolutely have to. And some dogs you absolutely have to because they have bad necks or bad throats and they can't use a collar and they don't sit still you know, with no leash whatsoever. So if you have to, do it. But if you can get away with no harness, try to do no harness. Um, they are retouching nightmares. If you have never paid attention to how a dog's hair grows, it goes in all sorts of different directions on their body. And it's so hard to make that look real. It can be done. Um, and it's a lot easier now than it used to be with, with Photoshop and how far Photoshop has come, but it's really, really difficult. So try not to use a harness unless you absolutely have to. And treats, we talked a little bit earlier about treats. Don't use treats unless nothing else is working. Um, a lot of times once the food comes out, it becomes all about the food. And it, it's, some dogs perform really well for treats and others you're gonna lose completely. And again, if you're, you know, if the dogs come during a consultation, this is another thing you might wanna try with them is how do they react to treats? Um, and that way you're not losing them if, if they react negatively. Um, if, during the session, you know in advance that treats are not gonna be awesome. Um, a couple of hints with treats. Uh, I always ask the owners if it's okay to give their dog some, some treats. Some dogs have allergies and that kind of stuff. And if that's the case, the owner should bring in whatever special treats they have for that dog. You don't want to end up giving a dog something it's allergic to and then having problems later and having to be responsible for that or liable for that. So make sure you talk to the owners first about, um, about the food before you give them the treat. And also, if you are going to use treats, use soft, small little training treats. Um, if you use hard crumbly treats, you're gonna be retouching crumbs out forever. So if you can find soft treats, and I use Little Jacks, they're called Little Jacks. Um, they're just tiny little soft training treats. And I get the smallest ones I can find because I don't wanna to have to wait for a dog to like chew and chew and chew and chew and down a huge treat. And I also feel a lot better about using multiple ones when it's just a teeny tiny little nugget. So. Um, they're probably like smaller than my thumbnails, the size of these treats, they're teeny tiny. But that has been huge once I discovered soft treats that don't crumble and I don't have to retouch them out. <laughs> that was a huge <laughs> discovery for me years ago. It's kind of like the harness thing, like figure out how to avoid extra work. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. So another thing we want to think about is trying, trying to get the ears up. Not every dog has big ears that stand straight up. Um, a lot of dogs have floppy ears, but even with floppy ears, they can still get their ear, ears up. And that makes a huge difference in your photography. This is the same dog, same session, similar poses, almost the same. And you can really see the difference. You know, the first one has such a great smile, but those ears are back. The second one um, it looks a little bit more intense, but you can see how those ears are up, even though they're floppy ears. Um, you can also see that the dog in the, in the second photo is looking at a treat on the floor. It's waiting for its command to, to retrieve it. And that's one of those things that, you know, the treat worked, but it didn't work at the same time. Like, I love that smile. And I think if the owner were going to choose between these two, they would probably choose that smile every day of the week. But those ears are just amazing in that second one. So this is, I would probably show the owner both of these and then let them choose from there. So, and yes, I would retouch out that, retouch out that treat later when they, uh, when they go to order, if they choose that one. So how do we do that? Noisemakers are great. Like I said at the beginning, dogs get bored fast. So you need to have a lot of noisemakers, a lot of new noises, um, squeakers, and um, all sorts of other things that uh, that you can use. Get creative, use, you know, whistle. You can use physical whistles. Uh, you can make goofy noises with your mouth. Um, you need to just be really creative with your noises to keep it interesting for them. Different volumes are great as well. Um, again, dogs don't like loud noises, but sometimes going from something really quiet makes them listen. And then all of a sudden, something just a little bit louder, it might spark up their attention. Um, I always ask the owners again about buzzwords or phrases, like do they know cookie or walk or ride? And if they know some of those little phrases, um, they might just look at you if you want to go for a ride. And also, of course, any question, who's here? want to go for a walk, any of that kind of stuff. Um, if a dog knows those things, they're going to be like, oh, yay, let's go and be all excited, um, which is really great. And a lot of times, too, with a question, it's not even what you're asking, it's how you're asking it. And I always joke that I can say, do you like my green sweater? And, you know, if you say it the right way, a dog will be like, oh, it's a green sweater. And they're going to, you know, give you that head tilt. And who cares what you're saying? It's just, it's the tone of what you're saying. And so that works well as well. <laughs> I also use a stuffed animal and I'll just toss it straight up in the air and catch it right by the camera. I work with a lot of greyhounds and sight hounds especially are just going to watch that. Um, but most dogs will. And so if you can either catch it right next to the camera or have an assistant who's catching it right next to the camera or even time it so if it's going to drop as they're watching it and they look right at the camera, you can get that shot. And, you know, you can't do it over and over and over and over and over. But if you're doing it every once in a while, it's going to be interesting to the dog knocking. I have wood floors so I can knock on a floor or I can send somebody into a different room and knock on the wall. Um, and that sometimes will get the dogs to be like, oh, what's that? Who's here? And sometimes dogs will run because <laughs> they think somebody's at the front door and they're going to run and see who it is because that's what they do at home. But most of the time the knocking is really just something different and interesting to them. Um, I also have this teeny tiny little metal bowl that I can clink with my fingernail or I can drop that on the floor. The metal bowl is like the international sign of food. Like most dogs use a metal bowl or a lot of dogs do for their, for their dinner. And, uh, and so if they hear any kind of little clinking on that metal bowl, they're going to be like, Ooh, 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 time for dinner. And it'll be very exciting to them as well. And yeah, you just have to make crazy sounds sometimes. Um, I'm not going to make them right now because it's just too embarrassing without a dog in front of me. Oh, we're missing but, out. Uh, we're missing out. Yeah, you're going to, well, you're going to have to come and watch me do a live demo somewhere in order to get that. How's that? Sound? <laughs> You got to see you in person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. So another thing we want to think about is how to get the mouth closed. Usually, you know, if a dog is stressed out or if it's hot, it's going to pant. If it's nervous, it's going to pant. A little bit of tongue is okay, but a lot, again, is not an attractive portrait. So there are breeds, though, like Huskies and Samoyeds and a, a lot of Arctic breeds that typically have their mouths open and they are panting normally. Like, that's just normal for them. And with a little research in, you know, what dogs are coming into your studio, you're going to know that kind of stuff. But there's still a difference between a mouth being open a little bit and the tongue hanging out. So here... Again, we have the same dog in the same session and very similar poses, but one, the mouth is open just a little bit and the other one, the mouth is open quite a bit. And you can really see the difference between those two and what's a little bit more attractive and what's not. The first image, the dog just totally looks like it's smiling. And the second one, it looks like it's hot and it is panting. So big difference with that. So how do you do that? Again, oh, noises. <laughs> 
What was that, Chris? Oh, we're, I was asking if you had any tricks on that. We had a question from Patty about that, but it looks like you're getting to it right now. I Yeah, I'm all over it. <laughs> How do you get that mouth closed? So noises are great. Um, you know, a lot of times if if you make an interesting noise for a dog, you know, if they're looking over here and they're panting and all of a sudden they hear something interesting, if they're, they're going to listen, they're going to close their mouth and they're going to look right at you to find out what that noise is. You might have just a split second, but the longer you do this kind of stuff, the more you understand the dog's body language and you can really predict what a dog is going to do. And so that's one of those things that with practice, you're going to understand how to, you know, get that split second. You can also use a finger to dry the dog's tongue. Now, I do not recommend that you guys are sticking your hands in strange dog's mouths. <laughs> if this is something you want to try, ask the owner just to try to do that because the dog is going to trust the owner a little bit as well, a lot more than you, and that would be the way to do it. Um, or, you know, just give it time to relax and get over being nervous. We talked earlier about just taking a short break. And if a dog is panting a lot, maybe it just needs to take a little break. And that's totally okay. And finally, you can also just wait for the dog to swallow. It, they're much like us where, you know, we normally are, like have saliva in our mouths and we and we resalivate our, our tongues. And if you swallow, now your mouth is going to be a little bit more dry and then you resalivate. And dogs do the same thing. And so when we swallow, we close our mouths. And if you can just time it right again when the dog swallows, you can get that shot. Um, now dogs will do funny things when they swallow. And so be prepared for that as well. I love to show silly photos of the dogs to my owners. Um, and I always tell them, this is probably not the shot that you're going to put on your wall as your wall portrait, but if you're getting an album or a book, these are really fun shots to include because they're total personality shots. But that being said, the little blue and white pity that's over on the right, um, that owner actually ordered that photo as a wall portrait. And it was really funny in his sales session because uh, he kept coming back to that one and he would just like giggle every single time. And finally, when it came time to like deciding on what he was going to order and like what sizes for what, he's like, you know what, I have to put that image on my wall because that is going to make me laugh every single day. And you know what? That works for me. That totally, that is awesome. And so that's what he ended up with for a wall portrait. So you just never know. So 10 minute warning. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Um, lens selection is also going to play a kind of a key role in into your style of photography and, and how you portray the different animals. Um, some people love wide angle lenses. Some people hate wide angle lenses, but this is something that when you understand different focal lengths, you can understand how you can make the dogs look different. So this is all the same dog in the same session. And you can see the picture of the dog in the top right corner with its owner. So you know the size of it. So using three different focal lengths, you can see how different this dog can look. So 200 millimeters versus 35 millimeters versus a 15 millimeter fisheye lens. That dog is going to go from highly compressed and its chest looking huge to just kind of fun and silly to really like a bobblehead. Um, I almost never use my fisheye lens for uh, for sessions because they do really look like bobbleheads but when i have a pet who comes in who's really really good and has a lot of personality it's really fun to pull it out and do a few shots i would never do an entire uh session with a fisheye lens but a few shots it's really fun but like you look at the size of the nose like the head size really for the most part is the same between each shot and if you compare the size of the nose between the three and the size of the chest between the three you can really understand the difference between uh, like a zoom lens and a wide angle lens and that's something that you know you if you get that and you can put it in your back pocket and you can understand it and use that to your advantage you can create some really cool stuff Here's another dog. This is a small dog. Um, again, check it out with its owner. You can see how small it is. And we don't have quite as wide um, a variety of focal lengths on this one, but we've got 105, 47, and 24. And again, the, like the head size is really very similar between all three. But when you start looking at the size of the nose and the size of the ears and like the just the width of the chest and the neck, you really start to see the difference. And this is the same lens throughout the session. So it's my 24 to 105 lens. And we can still create, you know, a really some different looks on this particular small dog just by zooming in and zooming out. So study that and think about that as you're photographing. Um, so I'm going to show you guys also, we can use um, more of a zoom lens for creating a beautiful statuesque and painterly photo of this dog. It's gorgeous. Like the pose is beautiful. The expression is beautiful. I love the painterly background. But this dog was awesome and silly, so guess what? Let's pull out the fisheye and let's create a really comical, weird photo of this dog. And that's hilarious. And so using those that knowledge to my advantage, I can, I can do that kind of stuff. 
Okay. Questions about all of that. Yes, we do have a few questions that are coming up. Um, yeah. So, uh, how do you decide which backdrop you're going to use for each specific pet? Um, so, usually in the consultation, I will talk to the owners about what coloring they've got in their home, um, what style they have in their home. I I love like the the painted backgrounds and the more classical look. That's just my style of photography. Sometimes the owners really don't care and they just they say, well, what do you think is going to look the best? Um, sometimes they've seen something on my website or in social media and they love a particular background. And so we'll we'll take a look at that. I had somebody recently, a little puppy that I did, and the woman was looking through some of my galleries and she's like, oh my God, this background. And so she saw it with a large dog though. So you saw a lot of the background. So I had to explain to her that her small little dog is, you're not going to see that much of it. It had some blues and some purples and like a lot of color in it. Um, that was really, it's watercolory and it's a beautiful backdrop, but she's only going to see a little teeny tiny bit of it, but she still loved it. And so what I ended up doing with that particular background was I moved it up and down. And so I got a little bit more blue and then I got a little bit more of the purple and we just adjusted it so she could still get kind of all of those colors. So it's really like, it kind of varies from, from one session to the other, but a lot of times I will choose it um, just because the owners don't really care. They just, they trust me. Cool. <laughs> We've got about five minutes left of the entire program oh. here and a couple oh more my questions. God! I know it's flying by like crazy. Um, so okay. question, um, what lens is your go-to lens when photographing owners with pets? So I will, depending upon how big the dogs are and how big the family is, um, if it's a lar large grouping, I'll typically use my 24 to 105. Otherwise, my 70 to 200 is my favorite lens. Okay. And which aperture do you normally use? I'm usually at um, about five, six, but again, it's going to depend upon the size of the grouping. But that's kind of my my starting point. With one dog, that that's great. That's great right there. Okay. Sometimes up to F8. Um, is it important to get the entire pet in focus or just the nose and eyes or what's the, what's the moneymaker there? Uh, the eyes for sure. Rule of thumb is from the nose to the tips of the ears. So you want the head in focus. Cool. That was the uh, end of our questions. Let's talk a little bit about dog wrangling in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> okay. We got a couple of minutes. Um, you're, this is going to be quick. Your assistant or your dog wrangler, it, like I said earlier, if you have somebody who can work with you on a regular basis, it's going to make your life a lot easier and the clients are going to love it as well. They love to be able to sit back and be amazed at how great you are. I can't tell you how many uh, clients have come in and they're like, oh my God, you guys are so good. Oh, this isn't the first time you've done this. And they make that joke all the time. But they love being able to sit back and watch us control their dog and how great their dog is in response to how we work with them. I've got um, this quick little video I'm going to show you. I'm going to cut it off about halfway and uh, just to show you a little bit about a dog, what a dog wrangler does. Kind of pulls all the magic out of it. We're looking at it and they're so active, but we look at the images and it's just like all magic that you get from it. Right. It's quite impressive. You're able to get all of those with how active that uh, dog was. Yeah. And this is just a puppy. So it looks like so you've fun. done this before. Right? 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 <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm not even the dog owner. <laughs> so funny. Okay. I'm going to keep going here. Um, we're going to skip inspiration. Do, 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 do. Sorry, guys. So a couple quick things. Um, if you need to build your portfolio um, or you want to establish a relationship with a rescue before marketing your skills as a photographer, rescues are always looking for volunteers to help out with photography. Um, if it, Just don't expect them to teach you how to do it, but it's a great way to give back and to build your portfolio and get the experience that you need. Adoptable pets who are professionally photographed are typically adopted between three and five times faster than those that are not because they look so much better in their profiles than what they do in a snapshot. Um, we're going to skip that. So if you guys want to learn a lot more about pets, 
Um, I want you guys to know about the Animal Image Makers Conference. It's an international conference that's held every year in April. We just did it, and this year it was virtual and it was amazing. Um, but please check it out, animalimagemakers.com. There's a link on the website for the Facebook group and all sorts of, of stuff. We've got amazing speakers coming up already scheduled for next year. So check all that out online. And um, one final thing is that if you guys are interested in this and you want some help and you want some critiques, um, uh, myself and along with three other women, um, Barbara Breitzemeter, Danica Barreau, and Angela Lawson so like do a monthly industry. critique <laughs> night online. Uh, no bones about it. And I know Chris has got a link he's going to put up for this. Um, and we do some assignments and we do monthly critiques and, and it's just awesome. And it, it's been amazing to see so much growth in pet photographers through this group. I absolutely love it. So, um, do, do, do. Here is my contact information. I want to thank Chris for hosting. I want to thank ECI for all of their amazingness. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now because I know we're out of time. Oh, it's so much more to tell you guys about. <laughs> <laughs> There's oh, so, so much fun. great information here. Just everybody's in chat, just like, whoa, my mind's blown. Uh, we are getting <laughs> questions on like, can we watch this again uh, next week on ACI's website? The replay will be live. So yes, if there was so much information that you didn't get it all down uh, next week, you can check it out there. We will be sending out a follow-up email as well. Um, so we do have access to that because man, there's just so much great information there's here. There's so much. Yeah. It's so hard to teach this stuff in such a short amount of time, uh, but that's all right. Well, yeah, that's part of the fun of only having like a one hour program is it's just all action. It's all fun stuff that's coming up. The dangle, the dangling fruit. <laughs> right. So I'm going to share my screen here and there we go. Hey, we can see. Nope. I've got this switched. Let's get that one up on here. There we go. OK, now we're sharing here. Uh, so we do have. Um, uh, Lisa's contact information here. Again, I put into the chat, um, you've got the links to Animal Image Makers as well as uh, to the Facebook group. And then the follow-up email that's gonna go out here in a couple hours, um, we'll have those links in there as well. So you can get a hold of Lisa. Um, so from ACI, I know we're kind of excited about it, uh, but memory books are 25% off um, for everybody that is watching this webinar live. You've got the special code that is now in the chat or on the little gift icon that you're seeing uh, next to there. It says uh, offer memory books that's on there. So you can get the special code that's only available to people that are watching this program and that have registered um, just like we do every episode. So memory books are absolutely fantastic. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about like what you like about memory books? Yeah, I love the memory books. Early. And so for, you know, there, I, I offer both the memory books and albums. And for people who don't necessarily want to pull the trigger for an album, the memory book is a great, like, first step to getting them to think about doing a book. Um, they're beautiful. I like the lay flat books. And um, and I typically get them um, with a glossy page. So it's UV, UV coded. And they're just absolutely gorgeous. Um, I use these both for my clients as, as well as myself personally. If I take a trip somewhere, it's a great way just to print my my photos from my trip and have because uh, they're really inexpensive and they're just gorgeous and they come in so many different sizes and oh uh, yeah like totally order these for you if you've never gotten one of these right. you need they're to kind order of addicting. one of these for yourself yeah 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 you're gonna start like I'm them, printing so. everything now. I love yes. it. So we've got some giveaways to do. So uh, first up, we've got some swag from ACI because who doesn't love swag? Uh, so let's go to the uh, official fun wheel and we'll see who our winner is. I just love the little count. I know. Look at all those names. That's amazing. <laughs> I know. There's everybody that's registered here. And for our first prize, uh, we've got Pam Gabriel. So you've got uh, <laughs> the um, swag pack. Um, so uh, make sure that you're emailing me so that I can get your size and all that fun stuff. Um, so up next, we've got a memory book from ACI, Ooh. so you can get your actual real life copy. I did make up the name for this one. It was just too cute not to, but. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. The rough right, life. The rough life. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's see who's getting our memory book. And there we go. We got Mary Jo. Mari. Mari, Mari nice. Jo. Awesome. And now Yay, we've got uh, one more prize. It's both swag and the memory book. I know, Whoa! right? The best of both worlds that we got coming on here. Uh, so let's see who that winner is. This is like my favorite part is just going through and just like. I know, right? 
That's so awesome. And it's Kimberly. Kimberly! <laughs> and Kimberly just put in the chat a minute ago. Ah, oh, I was so close That's on the right. last I one. I never win anything, back. right? Yeah, something else. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, cool. So we've got that. Um, I do want to uh, kind of let you know about some of the upcoming presentations that we have. Um, so the next one that we're doing is with Michael Mowbray from MoLights. Uh, we're going to be talking LED lights. So everything you've ever wanted to know about LED lights, how to do shoots with them. If we're looking at doing pet photography and you want that constant light option, LED lights is it, including uh, being able to ask some questions and find out about the guy that actually has a business selling these things. So he can answer all of those things. Uh, we've got yeah, Kimberly. Yeah, and Michael is awesome. I'll just, I'll just give him a shout out too. And he's a huge supporter of AIM. So that's amazing. So definitely you guys take part in that. Uh, so we do have Kimberly's program uh, coming up too. Yeah, we just saw Kimberly's name, but she's doing a program here for us in about a month. Um, so looking at events beyond weddings. Um, so figuring out how she uses technology when photographing events, uh, doing live streams, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's coming up soon. And then we've got Don McGregor doing posing for family portraiture. So if you never know how to actually pose family so they look good, what you're supposed to do, where hands go, all that fun stuff, Don's going to be demystifying that for for us. And finally, before we sign off for the night, um, do you want to say if you do have ideas for future episodes, uh, or if you think you'd be an amazing presenter for this, and you've got some content ready to go, um, email me hello at cwoolly.com. Uh, that way I can uh, get in touch with you, start getting great uh, content for you, and we can do more of this kind of fun stuff. Uh, but uh, we are officially at time on here. I know we had a ton of information that's on there. Make sure that you are reaching out to Lisa. She's got so much to share. And if you want all the rest of it, including the inspiration slides and everything like that, make sure you're watching her talk live. Whew, she has so much great information here and she's touring all over. AIM is a great resource there. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and uh, be sure, I'm going to put up a link real quick too. If you do want to go ahead and register now for that next one with uh, Michael, you can go ahead and do that. The link is live there. But that's an official wrap. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, thank so you much, everybody Lisa. for coming out tonight. This was so fun. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everybody.